Welcome back to What the Fat. Today I have on a very, very special guest, someone who is arguably uh, someone I consider one of the smartest guys when it comes to literally studying how to train your brain and how to optimize it from a performance standpoint. So, Dr. Andrew Hill, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ryan. Nice to be here. Awesome, man. Well, tell everyone a little bit about your background because I think it's fascinating. Like a lot of people I've had guests on before who are super interested in like training muscles and no one really talks about training their brain and like this is this is your area of expertise. So can you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. So I've been working in sort of human areas for years, for maybe 15, 20, 20 years at this point. And the idea, um, you know, in, in classic sort of psychological or medical perspectives, especially in the acute, you know, crisis area, is that we're treating things that are critical and you can treat it and then people move on. But in reality, that isn't how it usually works in psychology. We have these kind of holding patterns of, especially in acute crisis psych, you know, of, of, of just medicating people, minimizing symptoms, and they don't have much change. They come back to the same process again a few weeks or months later. And I worked in, in, a, in crisis work and acute psychiatric work and saw this. I worked a lot in autism and saw a lot of services brought to bear with very little change and very little reduction of suffering. Um, and for years, I was doing different you know, health and human service jobs. Uh, and then I was working at a psych hospital in Massachusetts and got pretty badly injured. I, I was in charge of doing all the hands-on restraints and teaching people how to do hands-on. And it was an understaffed crisis hospital. And uh, there was one day when I did like, you know, several restraints back to back. And then I went to take a break on a different floor and helped the nurse do a lift and blew out two discs in my lower back, just completely mm. shredded them. You know, L4, L5 and 5S1, of course, that's the ones that tend to go. And suddenly I was somebody with a lot of skill in human services, but no advanced degrees. And I couldn't like do lateral work within human services. And so for a while I did case management, worked with kids and got some other experiences. But um, the hospital I was working at ended up closing, as you know, hospitals do. And I went to work in high tech for several years. I did, you know, this is before big data. I was doing client server database stuff, you know, for going to companies, building custom CRMs, uh, teach them how to do sales. This is the Northeast where the energy industry is being deregulated. You know, energy was being privatized. So I'd go into like energy companies, oil and gas and electricity companies and teach their sales guys how to run sales through CRMs and build a CRM to match their, their uh, business model, basically. That was kind of fun, kind of high tech, and I got pretty geeky in sort of sales engineering, if you will. Um, and I kind of uh, kind of missed working with people. I had a lot of more nuanced skills working with people. So I eventually went back and found a job working in an autism center, and they did mostly neurofeedback. And I'd been wanting to get into this thing called neurofeedback or biofeedback in the brain for a while. I've been sort of aware of it, um, but I hadn't seen a good place to get my skills in or you know get really deeper into the brain stuff. And happened to get this, this, this internship at a center in Providence, Rhode Island, which does mostly autism and ADHD. And so I had a lot of experience with those populations. They hired me in the spot to work as a technician. And I quickly got my head around the neurofeedback, the brainwave-based uh, training we do there or did there. And it was kind of uh, in, in, in dramatic you know, opposition to what I'd seen before. Everything before that was people in holding patterns, minimizing suffering if they could, but people weren't getting any, any change. And then I saw in the center, most of the time, ADHD going away, sleep issues going away, seizures dropping away, uh, even things like autism being movable. And I was, from my perspective, you couldn't move stuff like that at that time, you know? I mean, I spent years teaching a guy to use a fork in one residential center that I, that I worked at. And that was my, my big accomplishment that, that year, like, you know, in the uh, early 90s, was teaching somebody how to use a fork through repetitive behavior. At the end of the year, he could use a fork. He didn't care, you know, but he was happy to use his hands. But now he could use a fork, so out in you know, restaurants and things, people stand at him less, you know, this guy with uh, some impairments. But such glacial, slow change for people with developmental issues. Mm -hmm. So then I worked in this uh, place in Providence called the Neurodevelopment Center, and I was seeing change all the time, not just every so often. And was shocked by it because it kind of flew in the face of what I thought to be true. Uh, and after working there for a couple of years, I decided I'd better go back and get a PhD and figure out what the heck was going on because there was so much agency and so much change available in this narrow environment. Yeah, I saw more change in a couple of years there than I'd seen in 20 years prior working in other environments and or 15 years at that point working in other environments. And it was just very impressive that we could do lots of quick things, but it was this sort of 
black art. I mean, there was three or four schools of thought back then doing neurofeedback who all have interesting ideas about how it works. The ideas are all uh, not reconcilable. So one person thought we're doing X to the brain, one, one group thought doing Y to the brain. And there were really you know, vitriolic fights going on, still are in the neurofeedback field about how this stuff should work and what's happening. And yet all these schools of thought were getting really good results. They were all getting change. And so I joke, this is what you call a blind man and elephant situation. You know, we have a piece of the truth. No, I have a rope. No, I have a leaf, you know? Okay, you have something. Right. You're, you know, your hands are on something, but don't be too, you know, don't believe what you got. Believe the effects. And so we kept seeing change. I went back to grad school and got a, a, a PhD in neuroscience, essentially studying attention in the brain, EEG, developmental stuff. I, I work at the, the two ends of the life course a lot. I look at developmental stuff for kids, and then I'm a, geri a geri uh, gerontologist. Excuse me. So for me, it's about peak performance across the life course. If you're having stuff in early childhood getting your way, let's get rid of that. You know, ADHD, seizures, migraines, autism, whatever. If you have stuff at the end of life course or in middle years, let's flatten that trajectory so you, or even in, incline it instead of having a long, slow uh, dip. I mean, you know, as a, as a, as a body-based fitness guy, this term sarcopenia, right? Age right. 30, a bunch of stuff starts to slide when the telomeres stop. Um, the telomeres are, a, are a, for those, I'm sure all your audience knows, but for those who don't, the telomeres are a little counter at the end of your um, genes, kind of like your shoelace cap, making sure your shoelaces don't, don't unravel. And every time you replicate a cell, you snip off a little bit of the shoelace cap to count. And about 50 replications in, uh, called the Hayflick limit or um, replicative senescence, when cells stop replicating, you're about 30 years old, about 50 divisions. And from then on, you can't recreate cells to the same degree. And you've got a drop in several body things like muscle mass, bone mass, water mass, but a raise in adipose. So you aren't losing everything, right? right. Um, so. There's a lot you can do, though, from age 30 to age 60. You don't, you don't have to be in a sarcopenia-driven place, and that's what people know about the body. The same things are happening in the brain with you know, um, fat and happy metabolism and good speed of processing, good sleep regulation, stress regulation. So all these things are measurable. You can look at your brain and figure out where your performance is in stress, sleep, attention, just like you can your, you know, your, 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 your muscle mass or you know, how much uh, weight you're, you can pull up on a bicep curl or something. So I started to move from a perspective of let's treat people from medical and psychological stuff into let's give people agency. And the more I get into neurofeedback, the more I get into biohacking in general, the less I think it has to be relegated to medical and psychological perspectives. So about four and a half years ago, I created a company called Peak Brain, which is essentially like an Equinox gym for the brain, where we do a lot of the same neurofeedback that psychologists do and, and therapists do, but we're not therapists, we're not your doctors, we're your coaches. And Peak Brain does brain mapping. We look at your brain, help you understand your performance. And we give you the agency to go, oh, my executive function, my stress, my sleep. Yeah, I want to work on that. And then you can essentially exercise the stuff in the brain that is typically blind. And over a few weeks, you get changes in your experience and your resources. You can then map those again and assess those again. So it's very much like an iterative personal training kind of perspective. Um, the field of neurofeedback is not that old. It's probably only 50 years old. But there are only about five or 6,000 people in the U.S. doing it. So it's just kind of like relegated to niche and individual skilled people with their, you know, multiple domains of expertise, psychology, Windows, EEG, neurofeedback. That sort of need for all those skill sets has kept this relegated to a little bit of a, of a, um, a skilled practitioners as the people doing this work. And so Peak Brain's mission is to sort of break that scalability issue really towards the whole, you know, fitness perspective of quantified self and understanding what you can understand about the system and take control of it. We think you should do the same thing with your brain, essentially. Incredible, man. And I love how you're talking about performance across lifespan, right? From young to old. And just for people who might not understand a true definition of it, how do you yeah. define neurofeedback? Like what, what, is, what does that mean? So neurofeedback is um, exercising the brain. Uh, essentially, um, involuntarily. So people often know the word biofeedback, which is training stuff in the body using uh, usually technology-assisted cues. You want a different heart rate, you put a sensor on your heart, you know, watch, watch your heart rate or whatever, and then as your heart rate variably changes, you can actually exercise it. Whenever, let's say, HRV moves in the right direction, your heart math device goes chime, you know, that's biofeedback. Or you sit and do hand warming, you have a headache, make your hands warmer, it actually pulls regulatory features around. That's voluntary control, peripheral nervous system. 
central biofeedback, biofeedback on the brain is involuntary. We call it neurofeedback, but essentially you're measuring things that are changing moment to moment, blood flow, the amount of brain waves or the speed of brain waves. And whenever they happen to shift on their own in the right direction, we go, hey, good job, brain, by providing more audio and visual feedback. So it's this involuntary operant conditioning. You might sit down and look at a computer screen with a, a Pac-Man on it, and it only moves when your brain happens to make, let's say, lower theta and more beta, which is an executive function mode. So I can watch the normal things that are fluctuating, when they happen to move towards strength and resilience in a way we think will you know, serve your needs, we'll go, yeah, brain. And the brain re reacts to that by reaching for more of it, more of the stimulus. Oh, wait, dropping my theta made a spaceship fly faster? Ooh, I'm going to drop my theta again. And the mind has no real experience of this. You're like, why is the spaceship stopping and starting? But the next day, your brain reaches for that same brainwave state, and you feel that. So it's like working out. The next day going, ooh, how do I feel? Oh, nice. Hey, I got a workout. Cool. Or, wow, that was too much. I came with my arms today. Or, I didn't feel it. You know, So this very iterative where we look at the things that your brain is doing, and we exercise the brain, again, by involuntary applauding what it's doing. So create a small shift. The next day, we look at that shift. And then if it's good, we keep pushing you further and further in that direction. And some around 20 to 40 sessions in, whatever we're exercising becomes a permanent new resource you can voluntarily control. Incredible. And so... When someone comes in and you're first starting to work with them, is the first thing you do is some of this brain mapping? Like, uh, exactly. can you talk a little bit about what that process is and what you what you determine when you map someone's brain? Yeah, absolutely. We do two things with our assessments. One is an attention test. We have you sit at a computer screen and, and, and click on a number. One or two pops up or speaks over the speakers, and you simply have to click the mouse button every time you see a one and ignore everything else. But we make this happen about once per second, which drops into a non-automatic time of attention. So we unload your attention so you can't game anything. And look at how you fail over. Is it impulsivity, you know, clicking too much? Is it inattention? Is it auditory? Is it visual? Short term, long term? So we tease apart the executive function for your performance. And that's a pretty um, stable, interpretable set of uh, data. But we combine it with the brain activity. So to gather that data, we put a cap on your head. And we squirt it full of gel and you sit still for like 10 minutes, that's it. And we take the resting baselines, the averages of your brain, and compare that, as well as the attention performance, to a database of people your age. And look for population level differences and say, you know, this thing that's different from average might mean X, sometimes it could mean Y. Uh, is that true for you? And if it is, we now know what's going on. So again, not a diagnostic process. Um, here's one example, there's a spot in the brain in the front middle called the anterior cingulate, part of the default mode network, and it decides what's important to focus your attention on. And if the DMN in the front, the anterior cingulate, is a little extra active in beta, it might mean it's a problem, might not. For many people, when it's hot, you perseverate. It's stuck in your head, bite your nails, and OCD. For other people, it's just a CEO. So the OCD marker and the CEO marker are the same thing. I can't tell if it's a problem, I can tell it's unusual. Or you know, people are built sort of strange, so what's, a, what's a really a suffering point for somebody else is mild for, some, for a different person. And so I go through your brain mapping data with you and say, you know, for many people, this means X or could mean Y. What do you think? Where's the meaning you're going to make out of this? So this is much closer to a coach going through performance data saying, oh, we found some performance data. Is this relevant? Do you care about this based on our current goal? You do. Great. So I have this weird relationship where I'm like, oh, is this suffering thing in your brain real? You're like, yeah. Awesome. Let's, let's, let's change work it. on it. Right. Yeah. And then we go after exercise in the brain waves. And we do three times a week, half an hour of exercises, involuntary, you know, shaping the brain. And after somewhere around uh, 15, 20 sessions, you're getting a really strong change in performance. We, we remap the brain every 20 sessions and measure the executive function. Um, in the classic case, like ADHD or something, we typically take somebody from a few standard deviations below average in performance to above average in performance, like a good four standard deviation change in a few months. Wow. I mean, now, really dramatic changes. Now, with people, because I'm sure people are visualizing now that are listening to this of like, hey, it's going over your head. Is there like, there's not these needles that are going inside no, of your scalp. How does it, how does it able to measure that activity? Yeah, so we're sticking a little silver wire to your head. That's all we're doing. Uh, a couple of your clips here. I actually have some right here. I'll step away for one second and show you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so what I've got, what I've got is an EEG amplifier, a little tiny one here. To show it to you. So this is this will measure your brain waves. And so I'll plug this with a USB into the computer, 
And then I got some wires here. I'll show you. They're kind of tangled. I was back from a workshop. But a couple of silver ear clips. So you put some paste on them. You stick them in the ears. So both ears. And then you have a little flat wire, a little silver wire. So put some paste on that and stick it to the part of the brain I want to exercise, or part of the head. And I measure, like, this part of the head, for instance, is involved with supervisory attention, knowing if you're paying attention. You've got some ADHD, measure theta and beta right there, exercise the brain the right way. you got some of that hyper-focused stuff, you want to relax that, measure right there. Whenever it unclenches a little bit, applaud the brain. So many people do neurofeedback as a whole head kind of, you let the computer decide what to do. We are much more specific. We go after very particular circuits and lean on them and say, oh, how'd that feel? And so we can use these individual wires, just one or two at a time, and figure out what your brain's doing and train either individual regions or connectivity between regions. And we very specifically go through like foundational workouts. Kind of like if you never worked out before, you're the guy that you know wheezed up the one step into the gym and you're like, I want abs. Okay, buddy, you can have abs, but it's a different process than if like, you know, Laird Hamilton walked in. I want better abs. Okay, Laird, let's just, you know, do some small tweaks. So it's this sort of perspective of, you know, it's really bespoke, you know, personal training. So I look at your brain and figure out which resources you want to go after. You tell me, not, not vice versa. And then we exercise these things. And after about three or four sessions, you start feeling it. About three sessions in, you're like, wait a minute, something's different. And then you get a little lift off for about 24 hours from every session. And you evaluate, oh, how'd that feel? And so you get shifts in sleep, mood, attention, stress, as well as big things like seizures and migraines and trauma experiences. You can really work on those over time. And I find that regardless of what we're working on, I kind of jump around on, on topic here, but regardless of what we're working on, the, the, the perspective is one of agency, taking control of stuff that's usually blind. And this is why we do it this way. So Peak Brain helps you understand your brain maps. I don't write you a report, but I teach you to read your maps. And we provide free maps for life after the first one. We, we're happy to have you reassess your brain. And this stuff's usually very, very expensive, the, um, the mapping and the neurofeedback. We're priced closer to a gym than we are a doctor's office. So oh. most of my colleagues are three to four times as expensive as we are because it's not the same relationship. They're sitting doing therapy and neurofeedback. We're your place to come and get your brain exercise in. And when we're watching surveys and your sleep, your stress, your mood, your attention, and as things fluctuate, we periodically go back to the data to help you, you know, help us understand what's changing, help you refine your goals. And then it's sort of iterative from there. But most of my clients will do about three to four months of training and make permanent large changes in things like anxiety, trauma, and attention. Wow, that's incredible. Um, do you guys now have a ton of data where like if someone comes in and say they don't know, maybe they didn't, they've never gotten diagnosed with ADHD, but yeah. all of a sudden they come in and all of a sudden you're like, your brain is mapping like someone who typically has ADHD and then you kind of dig deeper. Have you ever, do you guys experience that a lot? I mean, a lot of times people come in with either the wrong diagnosis from my perspective mm -hmm. or, you know, they're really attached to a diagnosis. I don't really care what the label is. And in fact, I'm always going to drop one level below the diagnostic label somebody gave you anyways. I don't care if it's ADHD, but if I see impulsivity, that's real. You know, maybe you had a concussion or two. I don't know. Maybe your speed of processing is low. That's real. We can measure the individual resources. So I have to walk that line between being a, a physiological based person, a psychological based person. You know, one example is a depression. There's no brain feature for depression. You know, there's no brain signature in terms of EEG. There are some things that look like sluggish or slow or burnt out, but there are signatures for most flavors of anxiety. Those are individual cramped circuits, the way like a low back muscle gets cramped to protect your spine. It's really strong muscles when those erector muscles are keeping, you know, that low spine nice and, nice and uh, stable. The muscles don't feel good. They aren't regulating moment to moment. But they're really strong. Same thing happens with the cingulates. The anterior cingulate is like, threat detecting or you know a selection of attention, the back is more uh, ruminating and evaluating what's happening around you. You need that. If you drop your phone in the car, you're fishing for the phone, not that you would do this, but if you did, there's a sense of, uh, watch the road that creeps in. Great, you're supposed to, okay, reorient. That's the posterior cingulate. Or the front is like deciding what to focus on. You need that stuff. But if it gets cramped or stuck, now you experience uh, perseveration or stuck thoughts, rumination or stuck sort of evaluation. And then you can also look around the brain and find executive function circuits and sleep signatures and that kind of broad regulatory stuff. So 
I often work on those sort of core things for people as if they've never worked out before. And we get such broad changes that we off, we often change things we never expected. I'm sure you experienced this from a fitness perspective. People work out with you for a few weeks. And they come back in, they're like, wow, my balance is great. That's some great sex last night. And you weren't working on balance or sex, but it just bleeds into every aspect of your life because it's your resources. Love that. Love that. And how often do you guys deal with um, people that have like addiction? And, and, and I know you have an interesting approach of dealing with people who – like whether it's drug, alcohol, yeah. whatever. I, I, there's a bunch of different forms of addiction. What are you – like how's your guys' approach to that been? Yeah, you know, I used to run a neurofeedback center that had a big addiction focus. Um, mm-hmm. And we just outgrew the addiction side so thoroughly that I split off into another company. Huh. Um, we have a great result to the addiction is a short answer. I can give you a, I can take a chronic burnt and alcoholic who can't fall asleep without a drink 20 years into drinking. Within a few weeks, they can turn their mind off and fall asleep at will with no alcohol. Wow. Um, but, al- but addiction's never, from my perspective, it's never about the substance. It's always about a dysregulated relationship with substances or with stimuli. Mm-hmm. So you might be addicted to a substance, but like, you know, cannabis, alcohol, cocaine, whatever, that's about the relationship. There's impulsivity there. There's maybe some anxiety there. There's some discomfort with your internal environment. Those are things you can work on. I love it. So, so you're, 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 you're getting to the root cause rather than like it's not the substance itself. There's a lot of deeper rooted issues awesome. inside here. Yeah. And no, no, if someone's really you know decompensated with their substance relationship, neurofeedback may not be the only thing you need. Hmm. And then I'll say, hey, this guy on the street does mindfulness-based relapse prevention, or you want to be moderate? Great. Go find a smart recovery group or a moderation management group, MM, or, or smart or great groups that are alternatives to AA. I'm not a big fan of AA, the helpless and hopeless, rob you of agency, you're, you're powerless thing. Not a fan. Hmm. I do like the give you more understanding and agency. And so the alternatives there would be smart recovery, which is abstinence-based, or moderation management, which is moderation-based, have similar kind of group structure support, but without the sort of loss of agency. Um, and so I encourage people to do that if they have alcohol issues. Uh, someone's got a big opiate issue, well, you know, you should probably work with an addiction specialist because you can't withdraw from opiates without risking your life. Right. You know, but if someone's smoking too much weed or drinking too much alcohol and it's subacute, eh, you know, can, uh, neurofeedback drops your tolerance to cannabis almost instantly within a few weeks. So if you're a chronic stoner, a few weeks in, you can keep smoking weed at a fraction of the amount you've been smoking, and you have the same effect. Amazing. But no, but not, not on a lung hit the same way, you know? And, you know, my mind instantly goes, and you got me thinking, because I think, like I said, addiction comes in many forms, and, like, food addiction is real. Do you guys experience that a lot with people who have, like, obesity, and they come in, and all of a sudden they're just like, like you said, maybe it's not the substance of I'm addicted to food. It's more just they're 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 trained to do it, or there's something going on internally for them to – triggered that um it, it's quite broad of course i mean some people do have dysregulated relations with all stimulus or, right. you know all stimuli they're looking for things to put into the you know the hole um, and that can be food but you know food's a good one food um things like sex things like mm. you know um television there's lots of things you, you probably shouldn't just quit completely like you shouldn't quit eating completely right i mean i'm a big fan of not eating periodically <laughs> but you're not going to ever stop eating right um, you probably shouldn't have to if you don't want to stop having sex or watching television, but you might want to have a better relationship with these high valenced, exciting things. I think if you examine how the relationship, how the stimulus is getting in the way, you can start to tease apart you know, where things are operating. And it often is as simple as a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of ADHD, some sleep issues, and then not feeling super comfortable. And so we reach for stimul- stimulants and drugs and other things like that to feel a little better which then throws off the regulatory features of attention, stress, and sleep, which means you reach for those things more, you know, vicious cycle. So right. fascinating work. I, I love, I love what you guys are doing. I want to jump into and ask you some questions that are applicable for people. Like what are, what's a biohack for instance, that you might recommend to someone without technology? What's something that they could utilize sure. to help them hack their brain, so to speak? Yeah. There's a bunch of things you're doing. You're carrying the equipment around always with you. Um, there's really two answers here. One is sorting things out that you do every day, and one is adding some new interventions. Mm. I mean, you're always sleeping, hopefully, every day, uh, and eating. So there's lots of things you can do with the basic timing of those things. The circadian entrainment stuff is the biggest hack you have access to. There's, big, there's levers built in in lifestyle that will completely control your circadian rhythm. And unlike most biohackers, I don't care about light. 
I know I'm a heretic in that. Um, I care about food. When you eat is by far the biggest entrainment, the biggest lever for when your body knows what time of day it is. And evening eating is about the worst thing you can do for circadian entrainment, especially for women. The circadian rhythm is a little shorter. You'll get disrupted more if you eat late at, at late at night. But one of my biggest rules of thumb for biohacking your circadian rhythm is for fast uh, fasting for three to four hours before bed. Mm. It allows your insulin to drop fully if you're not you know dysregulated. And then when you go to sleep, about an hour and a half into sleep, you'll have this uh, release of growth hormone. And if you're 40 or above, the only growth hormone you're getting is right then, by the way, unless you have insulin in your system and then you have no growth hormone released. So if you snack before bed and go to sleep, you skim the surface of sleep all night long, don't get pulled down into delta sleep, don't have a release of growth hormone, don't repair your body, wake up tired, cranky, you know, and it can keep going. So first rule of thumb, fast before bed to allow insulin to drop so you can get into good growth hormone modes. Second rule of circadian rhythm hacking, consistent wake time in the morning. I don't care when you go to bed, it'll sort itself out, but I don't want you sleeping in two hours that one day a week again, because it'll progress your circadian rhythm for a few days and they have to recover from that the whole time. Uh, and third rule is get some exercise in the morning before you exercise, before you um, eat. Hmm. So if you exercise a little bit before you eat, it's a very strong circadian cue to the brain. Leave the cave, go hunt, the, hunt chickens in the jungle. Like this, We have to be able to exert energy before we consume energy. We're built to do that first thing in the morning after fasting, so you should tap into that. Plus, for anyone who needs a bit of a bribe for your body, if you are keto adapted at all and you work out in the morning before eating versus the end of the day, you burn six times as much adipose by working out keto adapted fast in the morning. So that's the time to do it. For sure. And those are easy things to drag your circadian rhythm back into play essentially. Amazing. And is there, do you have a specific based on what you've seen or what you recommend hours of sleep? Like, Oh, you need to get this many hours or is it kind of like, eh. it's varied. Um, you know, seven to eight is pretty good for adults. Uh, eight to 10 is good for kids or nine to 12 for younger kids. Um, it's all about the amount of deep sleep. I, I a couple right. of things, we're all using these sleep trackers, right? And other you know, devices these days. Yeah. They don't work that well, by the way. They're mostly not that great. And if they work well for you, you're lucky. They didn't, this one works well if you're average right. in terms of hand shape and size, how much your hand swells at night. I work with hundreds of people who have monitoring devices on their bodies. Most are quite poor. Mm. Um, so you should use like a sleep tracker the way you use a body fat scale. The number's not that accurate, but if it changes, it might be relevant. And then these devices are not very good at doing anything but measuring light versus deep. So the RAM is, is irrelevant, by the way, in these devices. Don't believe them. People come to me all the time, oh, my device is I'm getting six hours of RAM or no RAM. I'm like, that's not possible. No RAM for a few nights means you go crazy. You right. become psychotic. Right. So you're getting plenty of RAM. Your brain will maintain its REM state, period. There's no you can't hack it. Don't worry about it. It's gonna self-assert. Deep sleep, though, is the first thing to go. And it's the most important thing. So I want you to watch your deep sleep on these devices and try to get a nice good amount, 20, you know, quarter your sleep if you can. Um, so like the, the the ring I have tells me my deep sleep is an hour to two, the wrist strap I have tells me it's uh, you know an hour and a half to two and a half, they're not exactly the same, but when I, you know, I get back from New York City from a workshop I did and didn't sleep super well, they both tell me I got crappy deep sleep, you know, and that's probably relevant. And when I don't watch TV all the way at the end of the night or don't eat food at night, or my room is cooler, I can watch and see what happens. So I think we should get devices just so we can watch to see what effect we uh, um, is, is had by pushing on things and then learn from that because people are variable. Hmm. You might have great insulin sensitivity, you can not get thrown it off by uh, having food at night. You might be somebody who can't have food you know, after 6 p.m. because you have lousy insulin or you're sensitive to like that response and it just stays chronically high. So you got to kind of learn the the the, uh, the response of the individual system you're, you're walking around with, but then once you know how it's responding, be it sleep or your brain activity, whatever it is, you not only have the the opportunity, but I would argue the responsibility right. to now change it. You know, that's huge. I think we do have a responsibility to once we understand our physiology of like. I think most people, like you mentioned, uh, fall more on the spectrum of insulin resistant than insulin sensitive. And I yeah. love the advice you gave of, hey, limit limit your eating. Do not eat within three to four hours before you go into bed. Some of the other stuff, like uh, when you said watching TV, do you notice? 
do you think that's from a stimulation of blue light or do you think it's from just an overstimulation of like literally these people watching Netflix and like falling the latter. asleep? Yeah, I think it's the latter. Okay. Um, I don't think blue light is a big deal. I, I know my friends in the biohacking world are, are hating me when I'm saying this, especially the guys I know who have companies that make glasses with orange right. and red, red lenses. But And these are nice guys. They're friends of mine. I, I, I like their companies. But I think that's a very weak effect. Evening light, I think, is not that much of an issue. Um, the light I care about is in the morning in terms of circadian hacking. Uh, women are very sensitive to having their circadian rhythm perturbed at the end of the day because it's at the end of their cycle. They're a little bit shorter, so anything that stretches it pushes harder on them. And if a woman uh, looks at her cell phone right before bed or wakes up and stares at it for 20 minutes you get a one hour progression of circadian rhythm it's not very big hmm. you can handle an hour a day yourself by just recovering from it across one time zone you don't even notice it it's a small effect but morning light re-entrains the brain strongly to what time of day it is there's a special nucleus behind the eyes there's a the optic nerves go in and cross called the optic chiasm the, the x you know, greek letter chi and above the optic cross or optic chiasm is this nucleus called the suprachiasmatic nucleus above the optic chiasm. And the SCN, its job is to monitor the temperature of light hitting the retina. And when the sun is low on the horizon, a lot of the frequencies get in that are very different when it's high in the sky. So in the first hour after dawn, blue light gets in in a very special way. It will tell your body, oh, it's morning, and re-entrain a lot of other organ systems. This SCN in the brain re-entrains all the other pacemakers. Each organ system and other brain circuit has its own timing. And they get re-synchronized about once a day to each other if, if your brain's doing well. And you need that morning light to do it. So another rule of thumb, which does tie into the first ones, is get up within an hour of dawn mm. every day. Before or after, I don't care. But get up within an hour of dawn and make sure there's natural light hitting your face in that first hour. Got it. Now, are those receptors, because I've seen, and you're the perfect guy to ask, is that does it happen only in the eyes? Because that you, I've seen people utilize those blue light things that yeah, go inside your ears, ears yeah. to try and do it. In terms of the SCN, it's it's only the eyes. There are right. photoreceptors in the skin and other places that seem to be sensitive to light. Right. But this particular circuit, the SCN master clock resynchronizer, appears to be primarily driven by bipolar cells and ganglion cells and retinal cells throwing the information back to the eye. Got it, got it. So, and this also involves in things like sexual behavior and maternal behavior. Like the SCN is a pretty complicated structure, but the biggest thing it does is timing. And so what I would guess is the other timing circuits will feed into the SCN with weak information so it can integrate it from the strong information. It's like, it's like balance, you know, vestibular stuff has multiple things coming in. Right. They get integrated very, very well. And you don't notice if one of them is off. You know, like you have a balance issue, you might be fine until you close your eyes. Right. For instance, that's, that means to sign one of the three systems is kind of off. With your timing, you can get away for a while with having sloppy circadian cues. But if they're all sloppy, eventually your circadian rhythm slides past the earth and is opposite. And you're having high cortisol when you're asleep and low cortisol when you should be awake. And that can cause all kinds of mood and attention and other, you know, healing problems essentially and learning problems. You don't want to have to deal with so fascinating fascinating so we talked about some biohacks you can do without technology what about with what about with yeah technology? so i mean there's there's a whole range here of course but um you know i'm an expert if you will in neurofeedback i think mm -hmm. it can make the largest and most rapid change of anything we make multiple standard deviations a permanent change in attention sleep and stress things within a few months Nothing else. It's like, you know, deciding what more height and getting it done in a few months. These are huge things that don't otherwise change. But it's also this, you know, long process of working with somebody in a coaching way and iterating. It's kind of complicated. There are some other big sort of brute force biohacks that are somewhat uh, technological, but that have massive lifelong and, and cross complaint kind of benefits. The biggest one these days is hyperbaric oxygen. Mm. Um, HBOT or hyperbaric hyperbaric oxygen therapy is done a bunch of different ways. Historically, it's done for wound healing and for skin and for some neurological stuff and some respiratory stuff. But it turns out that even basic hyperbaric at low pressure, 1.3 atmospheres and above, has a massive epigenetic effect. So if, if you sit in a chamber that's 1.3 atmospheres, barely pressurized, and breathe in pure oxygen, well, let's, let's say you were sitting outside a chamber, just breathing pure oxygen, my guess is you're a pretty... Uh, in shape guy with good oxygen metabolism. Your saturation is probably 
You breathe in pure oxygen, it goes up to like 98.3 or something, you know, a little, little bit of a jump. You go into a chamber that's 1.3 atmospheres and breathe in pure oxygen, your blood plasma develops oxygen carrying capacity, not red blood cells, the plasma. And your oxygen saturation jumps to five to 600% of wow. what it would otherwise be. This is a hormetic stress. The body's like, whoa, what's going on? Yeah. And it's also an oxygenation effect, which is a different kind of uh, fuel, if you will. So the hormetic stress and the fueling uh, will, over time, cause tissues and inflammation to really, really go down, and it will kick off genetic changes, epigenetic or the environment responding to the, to the pressures of the environment. Somewhere around 25 days in, you have to do a lot of it, but the genes start to change dramatically. And it's about the biggest effect across all cause of human death. It's a huge effect. Hyperbaric reduces the total cause death across causes. The only other thing that does that to such a large extent is sauna, mm. which of course is tech, but more low tech. Right. And sauna is cheap, generally. Uh, hyperbaric is not cheap. In the US, it's usually a few hundred bucks a session. Um, but sauna, you can get one, we'll unit, build a cedar shed in your backyard and sit in it, you know? Um, again, my biohacker friends are going to hate this, but I really, really prefer traditional hot saunas over infrared. Ah, interesting. Don't think the literature's there in the infrared. I don't think it's as good. And I think that, you know, you're better off sitting in a shack, sweating your butt off than you are, you know, not basically. What about uh, steam? Steam doesn't get hot enough. Mm. Steam will burn you before you get too hot, you know? Right. I mean, I was watching Joe Rogan a couple months ago. He was seeing how hot he could make his sauna. And he was up there in the 212 degree Fahrenheit sauna. If that was steam, he'd have burns all over his body. Right. You know, so you can, you can have a wet sauna. It's going to be a little bit cautious having a super steamy sauna or steam room and then going up in, up in temperature. So the, you want to be up in like the 160, 170, 180 range for some of these things. But if the air is not super wet, you can get much hotter and you get this like signal to your body blood rush to the surface, it causes all these changes. You wouldn't have tolerate it quite as much if it, was, if it was a steam room, or even less so if it was uh, like, a, like a hot tub or something. It doesn't get you hot enough before it cooks you, essentially. Right. So uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, saunas, or anything else that you recommend when it comes to? Meditation. To... Ah, yes. Yeah, that's another no-tech one, so to speak. Yeah. But you can do high-tech versions of meditation with, with heart rate variability. Hmm. You know, train the vagus nerve that runs from the, the heart to the gut to the brain. The vagus is the is the wanderer. That's what it means in like Latin, and it, it's a bidirectional bidirectional nerve cluster that runs between the three big nerve clusters in the body, the three big brains: the heart, the brain, the gut. Have their complete uh, complex nervous systems that self regulate essentially. We have three little brains. Um, the vagus is the wanderer that connects them all. So when you get excited because you ran across town. And then you see the cute person, ooh, that's extra cute because the transfer of excitation or you, or you like are extra anxious one day, so you snap at somebody, you know, that's, that's the transfer of that activation up and down the vagus. The joke I tell my students is uh, what happens in the vagus doesn't stay in the vagus. Hmm. You know, it's, it's this, this, this process of change. And you can exercise the vagal tone through heart rate variability biofeedback. And that makes your heart react to the stress response appropriately and go back down to a low sympathetic versus parasympathetic activation state. So HRV is somewhat technical, but not hard to do. And then get less technical meditation, which is simply anchoring your attention in particular ways to build executive function. People think meditation is relaxation focused, but it's not really. Just like you don't go to the gym and be strong. You go to the gym and you lift. Later on, the function of lifting is having increased muscle strength and flexibility and whatever else. You go to, you go to the meditation cushion and you practice anchoring your mind you don't go there and be quiet and peaceful you know you go there and anchor your mind later on if you're lucky you got some spaciousness because you developed better tone for anchoring your mind but all my clients who i encourage to meditate will say things like oh i can't meditate my mind's too busy great you have lots of opportunity to notice when you've gotten distracted and re-anchor that's, right. that's meditation that's a rep good job do more right so, now now do you recommend guided meditation do you recommend don't. certain length I don't like guided meditation. Okay. I think if you have to get some guided meditation in to meditate, do it. You know, it's like working out. Right. The best exercise is the one you do. But I also think that guided meditation is like driving a bike with training wheels. Mm -hmm. It handles really differently. 
And you're not going to learn to do that like reverse steer, catch the bike as it swings around thing until you can sit there and go, whoa, I'm not focused anymore. And you can ignore the pain in your knee and the fantasizing and the dreaming and the planning and the wishing. You have to learn to anchor that for yourself, I really think. Um, and if you, you know, it's not fun. It's not hard. It's kind of boring and tedious and annoying, but you can do it. And if you need to use a guided meditation to start, go for it. But I'd rather do five minutes of self-anchored meditation than 20 minutes or half an hour of guided. And I really care more about the regularity too. I don't care so much what you do for meditation. Just do it every day. Just make sure it's, it's like a you know, mental floss. You, you wouldn't not brush your teeth one day. Right. You know, work on that resource. It's one that is flexible and changes day to day. So you can keep building it. That, that executive tone, if you will. Does it matter morning or evening? Um, or just as long as you get it in? I think the short answer is no, but there's, there's a classic joke about this, which is if you have half an hour, uh, uh, meditate in the morning. If you have an hour, meditate in the morning and the evening. If you don't have <laughs> an hour, you must meditate for two hours a day. <laughs> right. Meditation gives you back the time. If you're frenetic, rushing from one thing to the next all day long, being less effective, and you spend 20 minutes in the morning concentrating that executive function, the rest of your day, the time spreads out, you actually get that time back with interest dramatically. Right. So I never want to hear you say to me, somebody say to me, I don't have time to meditate. Did you watch TV today? Did you sit around your butt for five minutes? Did you like, you know, did you, did you just like browse Facebook for 20 minutes while you were, you know, on the bus? Like, what is it? You got, you got five minutes, 10 minutes to meditate. So I, I'm a big fan of morning meditation. I think it's the better time to do it because it can change the tone of your whole day. But some people really were, prefer to do it in the evening to shrug off the day. Um, I think it's good to do it both ways, but I, I prefer a, a regular practice that's early. But that's just my, my, my personal preference. I'm not sure there's any literature on that. Awesome. And before, I want to jump into nutrition, but before we do that, what's one aspect of brain performance that we should not tolerate when it gets in our way? Mm. A lot of times people let things get in our way. What's one that we should not tolerate? Yeah, the biggest thing that many humans experience that I don't think they should – put up with is um, speed of processing issues. Uh. There's, there's only three big things in the human brain that are real in terms of human performance. Like IQ, not real. It's not a real concept. It's IQ is what IQ tests measure. It's very circular. But if you dig in, you find there are things within IQ tests that actually are real. The biggest one is working memory. Mm. How many things you can hold in your mind? That can be enhanced through meditation. The next one is speed of processing. You know, literally how fast your brain works, the idling speed. The third one is implicit learning ability. Those are the only real three things. Those are much more real than IQ. Speed of processing and working memory are tightly tied together. How fast you can load stuff into your scratch pad and how well you can like hold things in your mind once they're in your scratch pad. That's working memory. Speed of processing declines with age and with stress and with fatigue and with everything else. Working memory doesn't decline that much. You, you, you can't really change it that much. You can a little bit maybe, meditation. You know, stay healthy. But speed of processing, it's all over the place. Hmm. So I could look at your brain and go, oh, your alpha waves are running a standard deviation slower than average. And my prediction would be, oh, you're having word finding issues in the afternoon. So it, you, can find, you can feel a speed of processing hitch. You can't grab words or concepts easily enough. When you're tired, you're having delayed recall or a little short-term memory blips where things slide off you. That is a speed of processing issue. Mm -hmm. And many of us have that across age. If it, if it shows up in your 60s, okay, maybe normal aging, you still don't need to tolerate it. Meditation and neurofeedback will speed you back up. But if it's happening in your 30s and 40s and 20s, you should definitely not tolerate word finding issues. That's the first sign of a speed of processing pinch is a word finding issue, delayed recall for words. Mm. When that shows up, it means your speeds have dragged down. If I look at your brain nine times out of 10, I also see your deep sleep is crappy at the same time. And then sometimes people push the beta waves, the thinking frequency is way up to compensate. And the metaphor I use is like a car driving around the emergency brake on, uh. but you've kept your foot on the floor to make up for it. So if you don't feel like your mind is as smooth or as quick as you like, you can pull things out reliably, and you're always dragging or straining, you're probably having an alpha speed, a speed of processing that's not where you want it to be. And you can fix that with sleep hacking, meditation, neurofeedback, a bunch of other stuff. Amazing. And so this is a perfect segue into some tips and tricks. But before we jump into that, there's one – what do you think of the people, because there's people in the biohacking space um, and there are people who are prescribed things like Adderall, things like modafinil. Yeah. How do those impact the brain? 
Yeah, I mean, Adderall's a small impact, uh, mm-hmm. but not small, but it's you know it's a well understood impact. It sort of changes dopamine signaling a little bit and pushes up executive function. But Adderall also makes you less able to use some of those resources. So mm-hmm. if you have a very significant issue, strong ADHD, Adderall may help or other stimulants may help. But in general, I often do assessments on people with and without their medications. I mean, people, I mean, once you've had a map at peak brain, come back and we're your lab, whatever you want to do. Look at your brain on, on nootropics, on modafinil, on cannabis. That's awesome, go for it. And I've seen a lot of this. Um, stimulants can improve performance, but they often do so at, the, at the, the cost of creativity and sleep and you know, good stress response. And then things like modafinil, stay away from that. Modafinil should be used if you have narcolepsy, and that's about it. If you're trying to hack your attention with modafinil, there's a early review paper called, uh, what's the title, like Approved and Investigational Uses of Modafinil. I forget who the author is. But um, it showed that across ADHD studies, it's a metadata study, across ADHD studies, there's dramatically increased side effects from modafinil. Because if you have a histamine issue already, you're going to crank it up and cause problems. I mean, it's kind of a joke, a, a, a trope, right, of the geek with allergies. There's a reason for that. The highly intelligent, driven, anxious people have high histamine. If you have ADHD and some high histamine, you take modafinil, you're going to crank it up even more and cause histamine issues. Hmm. And I'm not a big fan of that. I think you can, I'd rather get rid of your problem for good by meditating and doing neurofeedback versus palliatively make yourself shrug off the sleep issue you have last night. Because... If you read the work of uh, Martijn Arns, A-R-N-S, Martin did a lot of work in, in Netherlands showing that ADHD is at least partially a failure of sleep spindle stabilization. ADHD is a sleep issue, at least partially. Mm. So you're, of course you're going to shrug off the consequence with the daffodil or Adderall, but you might not be doing yourself any favors in the resources long term. Fascinating. Now I have to ask another question to piggyback off that. What about sure. uh, what about plant medicine? Have you ever had anyone come in and do like ayahuasca or any of these? Sure, do, yeah. lots actually. Um, most people come in before and after an event, mm, okay. an ordeal. You know, yep. ayahuasca, some plant medicine ordeal. The brain looks the same before and after in the, mm. the ways that we do the, the the assessments. We do very high level course feature. I can't see your your states, only your traits. And those do not change with a, you know, one or two or three sweat lodges, ayahuasca events, whatever. I have some, you know, biohacker clients who microdose, uh, psilocybin, LSD, other things, and you see some subtle things. It's not that dramatic. Hmm. Mostly those things are boosting plasticity. That's why I think they, they do their job broadly. Um, and, you know, a single session of neurofeedback or a single session of, of meditation boosts plasticity too. So I think people need to make informed choices about stuff. And I think that if you have nothing wrong with you, you should be very uh, cautious in that risk versus reward. Sure. And, you know, that's your call. You have to navigate that for yourself. But if you don't have any real issues and you're simply seeking performance, there's almost no downside to things like meditation, neurofeedback, and some nootropics without, that don't have any side effects, you know, paracetam, mm. choline. I think that's a much safer way to go. The true nootropics, not the branded nootropics. I mean, all the Silicon Valley guys call modafinil a nootropic. It's not. Anything with a side effect is not a nootropic, you know? Right. So, but, but there's lots of nutritive nootropics. Um, tyrosine for attention. If you have ADHD, try tyrosine instead of Adderall. You'll feed the dopamine system with raw materials, not boost it at the end. You might get some of the same benefit. Or paracetam, which helps the brain oxygenate. Um, or uh, citicoline, which helps the brain remyelinate and help choline metabolism. So there's lots of you know functional medicine almost approaches here to dial in nootropic strategies for yourself that I think are probably more effective than other medication or, or smarter maybe than med- medication. But I also think you shouldn't bother to be transient. You, know, you shouldn't treat attention problems day to day. You should get rid of them over time. Right. You know. Now, something that uh, just popped in my mind that I forgot to ask earlier, how does your brain mapping differ from like SPECT imaging? Um, yeah. Because that's, I know that's a question some people are going to have. Sure. SPECT measures your blood flow hmm. uh, with radioactive tracers. So you, look, you find areas that are cold or, or cold spots or holes in the signal that suggest your brain has lower metabolism there than the places around it. The way you interpret that is by asking somebody who knows SPECT what it means. The only place to go that is the Amen Centers. The right. only people that use it in the world are the Amen Centers, pretty much. And Daniel Amen's a sweetheart and a brilliant man and a caring scientist and doctor. I have ultimate, utmost respect for him. And I think his tool set is really fascinating. But I can't use it. 
it's just too you know, it's, it's too in the weeds for me and it's not very you know it's not especially valid one person to the next you have to be a, a very good clinician a sophisticated clinician to read it right. but brain mapping i first compare you to a database of people your age and only then do i make the judgments for you so we start with a much more uh sort of range set of data for you so you understand at least here's what's unusual here's what's not and then we make the meaning versus Dr. Amen looking at your brain going, oh, you use cannabis or, oh, you're schizophrenic. Right. He can do that. But I don't, want to, I don't want every client to have to come to me to get the benefits. I want to spend a couple of days teaching you about your brain map as we get deeper in. And then as you remap your brain, you're the guy that makes the meaning as much as I do, maybe more. Fascinating. So. No, that's great. All right, let's jump into, because I know we're coming up here uh, close to an hour. Um, I want to jump into some tips you talked about fasting so yeah. what are your thoughts on fasting how can that help so um i think fasting is something we, we all do right every day mm -hmm. uh the body's designed to eat and to not eat right we move into catabolic versus anabolic mm -hmm. autophagy versus uh repair so i think it's really important to allow your insulin to drop completely frequently and depending on how your how bad you are, how Western your diet is, you know, how, how much your genes make you prone to, to diabetes or something. You may have to watch very, very carefully what's happening here. I mean, I was relatively healthy, but kind of overweight a year ago, mm. you know, just from years of living a Western diet. And I can't tell you the past 10 years, how many years I've gone low carb, keto, paleo, primal, and still carrying on 20 pounds of extra weight, you know, as a middle-aged dude. And then last February, a year ago, I tried alternate day fasting for four months and lost 45 pounds basically like uh, you know not even thinking about it and then i was eating crap the next three or four weeks burgers and shakes and pizzas kept losing weight wow. because i'd resensitized the glycogen and the insulin uh, in my liver and muscle so profoundly that my body's like oh you want to eat crap no no problem we got it for a while before i started to feel it like catch up with me but like you can use fasting to resensitize your insulin if you're chronically western so to speak in your diet but there's a sweet spot somewhere around 20 to 40 hours in right. where you start getting to the autophagy, cleaning up all the junk in the system. And so I try to do a 36 to a 60 hour fast about once every week or two because that gets me to the sweet spot. Around 66 hours, all the processes that are going to be turned on from fasting are really firmly kicked in. Up to about 80 hours, they might continue to accelerate. But the last sort of cleaning up processes that really, you really want to have happen kick in somewhere around 60 hours. So I started to do like a 36 to 66 hour fast once every two weeks, simply to keep myself from feeling the consequences of eating pizza and ice cream when I decide to. Got it. And when but I can't. Right. And and do you do do you do water only during that 60 hours? Coffee. 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 Black coffee, yeah. water, and salt. That's yeah. all I do. Okay. And salt, you know, pink salt for some electrolytes. And then water, I actually switch back and forth between Garolfiner and Pellegrino because they have different um, electrolytes. One's more potassium, one's more calcium. So I go back and forth between sparkling waters. I keep the, the, the balance up without having to think about fasting salts or electrolyte shakes or anything else. Interesting. And I don't, I, you know, if, if you're hungry when you're fasting, try salt before you try food. Yeah. You'll be shocked at how much it's usually salt. Uh, all the time. And we know with fasting, like in, when insulin's low, you're excreting out a lot more electrolytes. And yeah. you're get, like salt is a perfect way to replenish that. Yeah, exactly. I love that. Um, what about nutrition as a whole? Um, what like do you feel like a lot of people who eat a typical Western diet, regardless of fasting, non-fasting, do you think that damages some of their ability to process information? I I do just because of chronic inflammation. I don't right. think that I think this modern world we're eating way too much carb and starch and you know and also processed food. I'm, I mean I'm a big fan of being metabolically flexible. I want to be able to go eat a whole pizza. I really do. Yeah. I also want to be able to not eat for two days and not notice it. Right. If you can't do either, I think something's wrong. I know plenty of friends of mine who are like incredible fitness model athlete types, but buy a donut shop and fall into a coma. You know, mm. like you don't want to have to be quite that orthorexic with your diet. And just like you don't, don't want to be too crazy um, with your, uh, with your, um, your exercise. You want to do it the way that it will support you. And the same as your diet. And so I used to give lots of very strong, like, oh, everyone should be keto and primal and this. I don't. There's so many reasons you might have a different diet, philosophical, ethical, religious, cultural, convenience, access. 
So it's such a nuanced area. I find the most important thing is when you eat, not what you eat. And so I've, I've, I've pulled back to saying, look, compress your circadian you know, dysregulation by compressing food a little bit, fast in the morning, fast in the evening. Beyond that, you'll figure out if you have gluten issues, or want to eat vegan, or want to eat carnivore. That's a, a journey for every person. And it has to be a little bit developed per person because there's lots of things beyond simply the nutrition involved that will cause the decision making to change. So I no longer talk about what food to eat because I don't think it's useful for people to hear that from me. Love that. No, I love that you talk more about like, hey, when you, when you eat is important eat. and yeah. fasting being a part of that regimen. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I want to be conscious of your time. So a, a couple more questions is as we get older, um, yeah. what are some things that you find are the most important piece to help us continuing functioning in our prime or functioning optimally as much as possible? Well, that speed of processing is a big one we mentioned earlier. And right. if you're an elder, you're hitting 55, 65, and you're having word finding issues, you have a lousy speed of processing. So meditation will bring it back up. So we'll neurofeedback. So we'll uh, dropping inflammation. So we'll sleep hacking. Um, you have some opportunity to reverse some of these things. We think of aging as a trajectory, but it's not really a trajectory that's inviolate. You can flatten it. You can increase it. I mean, Arnold has a bit more muscle mass than I do and will ever have. And he probably gained more muscle in the past 10 years than I will ever gain, you know, because <laughs> yeah. he has that, 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 that body, that ability, that lifestyle, and he's at that foundation. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a nuanced area, but I think that essentially it comes down to responsibility. You have control over these things. So, you know, you might as well take control of these things. Love that. Um, and then one of the last questions I want to ask you, because this is a, a very important piece for me, is I talk a lot about being present, being in the here, yeah. being in the now, mindfulness. Um, what's your approach to that? And and people that really have this dysfunction potentially due to their brain of that's yeah. going on of like they're just not able to be present in the moment. Um, yeah. What what are some of your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, you can meditate. You know, you, you can do it. Even if it doesn't feel like it's working, it will work eventually. Um, keep doing it. You know, meditation. To paraphrase uh, Jack Cornfield is. Uh, Paying attention to the present moment on uh, in a particular way on purpose, and then I would add, in, add uh, replacing judgment with curiosity. What's happening right now in my mind? Not like, oh, I can't meditate. Um, I, I I think we all have this ability, and it's different for every pe for every person. Some people really love different aspects of meditation. Some people love single point awareness or concentration practices. Some love present time awareness or Vipassana. Some love open-hearted, loving kindness or metta. Some like a mantra like TM. I don't think it matters so much as long as you're doing it with some regularity and it feels like you can exert in that way. Uh, meditation should not be a relaxing process where you kind of leave your little audio tape and now you're chill. Right. You didn't meditate. You just got like soothed by an auditory. <laughs> you know? Love it. Okay, I want to wrap up with tips, practical takeaways to kind of sum everything up because you just dropped some incredible knowledge bombs on everyone that's listening to this. Um, obviously, meditation. Um, what are yeah. we talked about restricting the time period and what you're eating? Yeah. Um, so, what are some other hyperbaric oxygen therapy, if yeah. possible? Yeah. Sauna, fast if in possible. the evening, fast first thing in the morning. Do saunas a few times a week. Um, hyperbaric is expensive. You can afford one. Grab a 1.3 or above bag, and you know, do a bunch of it. Um, uh, and then you'll find. I mean, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of functional medicine. Not not a functional medicine doc, but I'm a big fan of like getting your genes sorted out, figuring out if you have gluten or not, or dairy or not, or which B vitamins might lubricate your MTHFR genes. So you can have your dopamine turn over better and feels anxiety. You know, there's lots of subtle things in the system here that can be nutritively supported. So I'm a big fan of having a functional medicine doc help you gap fill, you know, oh, don't do gluten, here's some B vitamins, et cetera, or whatever it is for you. Um, but I mean, it's, it's an ongoing process. You know, how many different ways have you approached your physical health? Right. You know, you have the same opportunity to approach your cognitive health and mental performance, but we haven't thought about that as much. So if you do nothing else but hold the perspective of it is changeable, shift happens, get yours, then you'll start seeing the opportunity for modifying small modifications. In gerontology, we talk about modifiable behaviors, small things that make a huge change in your trajectory. Having a cigarette a day doesn't do much. 50 years, might do a lot. Putting a seatbelt on every day doesn't do much. But after a few years, maybe it keeps you alive. Right. And I think that we have the opportunity to steer these things day to day 
and to get better and better and figure out what works for us because the system is very dynamic, very resilient. You can feel it swing and swing and you can control your stress, your mood, your tension, your thoughts, your, your deep relaxation, your focus. And the ways you might want to intervene on that stuff will really be pretty personal. And so, you know, I'm a, I'm a scientist. I want you to get data. Look at your brain. And then I'll tell you what you should work on. Beyond that, see what feels good. It, it, it's almost that simple of like, oh, yeah, that meditation felt like it worked. It's almost that simple for knowing what, what is going to move you over time in the right direction. Incredible. And neurofeedback. So if people are interested in, like, how can they go about getting it? If, if they're in L.A. or if they're in California in general, how, but yeah. how else? How else can they get? Yeah, so Peak Brain has offices in LA, in St. Louis. We're up in New York City pretty soon. We have a small office in London. We're up in Copenhagen. Um, and we do these workshops around the world every year, every month, where you can come and learn how to do it to yourself and leave with equipment and then have a remote coaching program. Oh, wow. So if the idea of doing coaching driven neurofeedback appeals to you, biohacking driven neurofeedback, you know, please feel free to come see us. We're actually less expensive than anyone else in the world, pretty much. But, um, there's five or 6,000 people in the U.S. to do this. Look in, your, look in your town. Find somebody who does biofeedback or neurofeedback. The threshold, I think, for quality neurofeedback is do they do brain mapping, Q-E-E-G? Because now it's tailored to you. Now it's actually assessment driven. Oh, your brain looks this way. Might want this. Let's see what happens. Not a big fan of the one-size-fits-all systems out there. Half the field is becoming one-size-fit. The computer makes the decisions. It's weak T, really weak T. Um, you might as well get the real stuff. And there are people doing the real stuff in almost every big city in the world. And if you can't find them, come see us. We'll map you. And then, you know, you have a low cost entry into it, of course. But, um, you know, it's, it's an ongoing process. It's technical. It's challenging a little bit to, you know, get involved with the technology. Um, we have other programs for training people how to do it to themselves. So not mm -hmm. just the self-training, but like I'll teach you to, to learn to map brains and map all the athletes you work with. So you can watch their stress versus mood versus sleep stuff fluctuate as you're dialing in their performance, for instance. Wow. So our job is simply to provide access to tech and then some navigation through that you know, forest. And your job is to decide whatever you want to do with it. So. Amazing. And where can people find you? Social media, website, mm -hmm. where can they find you? So Peak Brain Institute is the main website. Um, all of our socials are on Peak Brain LA. And my personal socials are uh, Andrew Hill PhD. Awesome. So um, please look us up. Uh, we always have uh, one of our senior staff in the chat box on the website. You can answer cool brain questions. And then, of course, you know, we're always happy to, to hear what your individual unique goals and challenges and experiences are around brain stuff. And then all of our big offices, St. Louis and L.A., the two big offices now, have free mindfulness classes in the evenings. Wow. If you're in L.A. or in St. Louis, you want to come meditate and get some skills, we're here. There's no charge. Just come practice. I have great teachers. We'll, 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 we'll search you out. Amazing. That is incredible. Well, Dr. Hill, this has been amazing. Uh, thank you so much. The last question I have to ask, and this is the question I ask everyone, is if today were your last day, what legacy would you want to leave to those that you know, your friends, your family, your loved ones? What legacy would you want people to remember Dr. Andrew Hill by? Demystifying, you know, your brain. You have control over your brain. I mean, I, I want people to hear that. You don't have to tolerate your attention problems, your sleep problems, your anxiety, your seizures, your migraines, your trauma. I mean, even severe things, major PTSD can be taken away and dissolved in a few weeks for many people with some of these biohacking techniques. So if your brain does not do what you want it to do, don't be satisfied with that. You, your brain is built to change. Get some. Amazing. Dr. Hill, thank you so much for all of your incredible work. Thank you for My coming pleasure. on. I appreciate you jumping onto the podcast. Of course. Guys, definitely go check him out. Check it. If you're in LA, if you're in St. Louis, if you're in any of these places, if not, just go check out. You guys have online stuff as well where people Absolutely. can get coached. Yeah. So thank you guys for tuning in. Appreciate you, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Ryan.